Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Princes of Popper podcast. I am your host, Andrew Batnich. Here with me is the chittering rat himself, Josh Worth. Hello. And uh, we have some stuff to talk about as far as the common ground of our format goes today. Um, so, as this is the first episode, what I kind of wanted to go ahead and start with was just kind of some introductions, who we are. Um, for those who might not be aware, my name again, Andrew Batnich. Um, I used to be a Southern California grinder. I uh, went to pretty much every IQ, PTQ, all that stuff that happened out there, every major event when we very rarely got them. Um, have a reasonable amount of top 32s, mostly in Legacy, playing uh, decks like Dredge in Legacy. Um, did pretty well at GPLA. Um, I had an interview at that tournament, but other than that, I haven't had a lot of, or a ton of success, and I, I, I think I'd like to accredit that to, uh, just not being able to get around a lot as I'm still in school and all that stuff, but, um, we'll figure that out as uh, a couple years <laughs> from now happen. <laughs> and, uh, what about you, Josh? Well, me for the most part, I've just been, uh, participating in uh, local IQs here at Star City Games, uh, top eighting a few of them, traveling up and down through North Carolina, grinding IQs, traveling to various GPs around the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most notable thing is uh, top eighting the uh, Popper Classic at SCG Con. Yeah, um, that definitely was a very uh, enjoyable event. We were both there. We were both playing. Um, that was awesome. I really do hope that in the future we get more uh, more streamlined popper events, um, in the paper realm at least. Oh yeah, man. Um, I was actually emailing um, Jared Silva the other day, like demanding more competitive REL stuff at because they're not doing anything for SCG WinterCon besides challenges. I I, th I thought it was so uh, weird that uh, SCG Summer like had all these really cool events lined up, and then like SCG Winter is like unstable sealed but at the comp REL level <laughs> yeah it's so and it's weird. like that's uh, like the one event <laughs> yeah there's a bunch of uh, like cash tournaments on either saturday or sunday for mm -hmm. modern standard and legacy um which is pretty all right but if they just added a popper one i would be the happiest man i i, I feel like there's a lot of people because what the popper classic i don't know the exact number but i think it got like in the 100 range right yeah uh we had we were, I think, very close to having the most, if not the uh, second most, because uh, we were like almost tied with standard in terms mm -hmm. of uh, attendance, and then modern was below us, and legacy was below that. And that's like standard before black red was the obvious best deck, so like people were still playing it, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it it was kind of crazy that uh, they had that success with stuff like the Vintage Tournament and the Popper Tournament, and we just don't see anything like that outside of, like, a challenge. Yeah. But, um, so, moving from that, we can talk a little bit more just about that tournament. Um, you brought Mono Black Control. I did. Um, I love that deck to death. Oh, it's a great deck. It, it's definitely always been on that list of decks that I want to be playing in the format, but just never made the commitment to it. And I think part of it comes from the fact that I owned it, like, years and years ago, but, like, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it was the first popper deck I ever built when uh, Star City Games was doing, like, little events on Saturday nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, First one I threw together, and since then, like, I've been slowly foiling it out and pipping it out. Yeah, um, no, right that's up. that's sweet. Um, I, I remember seeing it, and it's very, very pretty. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask, for that tournament specifically, was it more a uh, comfort choice? Or was it uh, just the deck that you thought would do best for that tournament? Um, a little bit both. It's the deck that I was definitely more comfortable with, because I've had so many reps with it, and I know it's good in bad matchups. Um, and it's just a very solid deck. It's always been in like tier one or two, depending upon the format. And I faced matchups where it was almost a guaranteed win. Like I faced, is it blitz and boggles <laughs> yeah. in, in the Swiss rounds? And I was like, Oh, look, edict effects. There we go. Um, so my main question, uh, for this deck, as we look at like the popper format on average 
is those the three big decks at the top. What's its Delver matchup like, in your opinion? Um, in mono blue, you just basically kind of like just make the game go as long as humanly possible, and you drain them of all your resources. And Kumbaj, which is really um, like carries the game for you because you just ping almost everything if you mm -hmm. get Kumbaj, which is on curve. Uh, against blue red, it gets a little bit harder because they can just have such explosive uh, openers that you were not be able to contain them, mm -hmm. especially after sideboard. Because I lost to Blue Red Delver in the top eight. <laughs> that, that's what I was wondering is um, that that top four was uh, the Elves player who won and then three copies of Blue Red Delver. And yeah. I was like, well, Elves doesn't seem like that bad of a matchup. Because it's kind of the same way that Kadolfa Boros handles Elves, where you just click target the ones that matter. <laughs> and oh, they just yeah, have man. like a bunch of random like mana Elves that don't matter left over. Um and then the Delver matchup, I wasn't 100% sure on how it is, but I could understand how it could be a little bit more of an even ground, just depending on how it plays. Yeah, because um, basically we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe for games one and two, and I uh, drug out game two to win. Uh, it was very narrow, and in game three, he had such an explosive uh, start, I was not able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I, had, uh, I just didn't have enough kill spells, and he had... Um, the three mana one with uh, Undying. The oh, the fire. Stormbound guys. The, yeah, that's definitely a card that'll give you some uh, trouble. Do you think there's any room in the deck for a card like Unmake to be able to handle a card like that? Um, there definitely is an argument to be made for that, but what I always do is I try to find what to cut to mm -hmm. in order to include that sort of thing. And the only thing I could think about cutting is just, like, one of your Edict effects for, like, more targeted removal. But just so those like, Edict effects are so good in some of the matchups. Exactly. So you gotta, like, do the give and take there. Mm -hmm. Which matchups are, do you want to shore up, and which matchups do you want to, like, loosen up a little bit? Okay. I can understand that um, discussion there. Um, so the, now we kind of understand the Delver uh, matchup. What do you think uh, your matchup against, like, the, uh, as, as much as I hate calling it this, the Kadolta Boros deck is? Um, I honestly really like the matchup as long as they don't go um, too wide too early because mm -hmm. you can deal with all their, like, single creatures, like your Glint Hawks and all those very easily. Uh, you just worry about Battle Screech tokens, and that's why um, I did it kind of last minute before the tournament. Uh, started. I did it like the night before. I added a one of Echoing Decay in the place mm -hmm. of a third, um, uh, the one mana I give minus two, minus two. Yeah, in, in place of the third disfigure. Um, I like that. I've always liked Echoing Decay as a card. Every teachings deck I play, I build, uh, has an Echoing Decay somewhere in the list. Oh yeah. Um, and just to use an example, my win in into, into top eight was against Cadolfa Boros, and he went. Battle Screech, flashback Battle Screech, and then he had another Battle Screech in the grave, and he flashed that back. So he had like a million tokens, and I was uh -huh. just, and I echoed to kid them all on the end of his turn, and it felt amazing. Oh yeah, I mean you cast one card and get. I mean it's only like one and a half cards, but he it, uh, put together a lot of things to get that one and a half cards. Oh yeah, but yeah, no, that's uh, definitely sweet. Um, no, I can understand that. I haven't played a ton against Mono Black Control as a the Boros deck is kind of the deck that I kind of champion in Poffer, but, um, so I don't know the matchup perfectly, but I could understand why it could be bad. I think there are some variants of the list that would be a little bit better. Um, I also would think that Palace Sentinels definitely plays a huge role in that matchup. Yep, you basically go Palace Sentinel versus Thorn of the Black Road. And one person playing kind four like versus one person... Out. Sorry, uh, one person playing four versus one person playing uh, two is huge. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and then lastly, the the last deck to kind of talk about as far as the top end of Popper goes is uh, the Tron matchup. What's the uh, Mono Black v. Tron matchup look like? Um, it honestly depends on what variant of Tron. Um, I honestly haven't gotten a lot of playtesting against it as Mono Black, mm -hmm. but you heavily depend on your sideboard because you run four choking sands to disrupt their mana and for the most part you target their colored mana because if they just have colorless you don't care <laughs> I, I understand that but um you don't have any real ways to interact with uh cards like pristine talisman or not uh pristine talisman i'm sorry um, oh, prophetic prison yeah prophetic prison 
Uh, you just kind of hope they don't get that, and if they do, they they uh, get choked on that mana, so they have like one, maybe two blue. Uh, two blue is really all they need for like the cap size stuff. Mm -hmm. So you try to tempo them a bit more. So you try to get as many chittering rats out. Frexian razors just start getting a little bit, bit more of a beat down early. Okay. So that when they do get their colored source, it might be too little, too late. Okay, I can understand that approach to the matchup. Um. So yeah, that kind of gives an insight into that event from your perspective. Um, from my perspective, when I came into that tournament, I expected a lot of people to be on Delver decks, as uh, Delver is a strategy that a lot of people just generally enjoy to play. And um, the deck that I like to play the most in Popper is the uh, Red White Monarch, Kadotha Boros, whatever you want to call the deck. Um, it's the deck that, in my opinion, has the most play in the most matchups, and the opponent misunderstands your role the most. Um, a lot of people will look at this red-white creature deck and assume it's an aggro deck, but I definitely believe it's more of a mid-rangey control deck. I wholeheartedly agree there. And I think that um, because of that tournament, I feel like there were a lot of people that were coming in with very little practice or very little format uh, understanding. So I assumed there were going to be a lot of people that would just look at Snow Delver or look at um, Affinity and just be like, I'm playing this deck because it's obviously good and it's a, a deck archetype that I already understand. Um, right. So that's why I played uh, Kodolfa Boros in it. I very unfortunately, and I was super unhappy about this, I got to buy the first round. <laughs> and then I played against uh, Blue Red Delver, which was the buy the second round as well. <laughs> yeah, essentially, essentially. But then I played against one of uh, our mutual friend of ours on Affinity, and we had a super tight uh, set of three. That matchup is literally how many copies of Fling does the opponent draw versus how many copies of, um, I can't even remember the name of it, uh, Prismatic Strands I draw. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Because they go like Fling Atog and you're like Strands. It's like, sweet two for one. <laughs> It's fantastic. It's great. But otherwise, it's a really hard matchup to win. And Strands isn't always good, is the other problem about it, because you can't uh, Strands for colorless. Oh, yeah, which is the majority of their creatures besides Atog and Carapace Orger. Mm -hmm. And maybe that Blue Serpent, if they're, if they're running the Blue Serpent. And it's always, like, in weird numbers on it. It's just not a consistent thing. You're pretty much hoping that if you keep any in, that it's countering a Fling or a Lethal Galvanic Blast. Exactly. But, um, played against that, made a couple sloppy mistakes against uh, Mono Green, just didn't decide to read the stupid two-drop that, uh, Wild Mongrel. Just uh, yeah. tried to Prismatic Strands a Wild Mongrel and he changed its color, because I just didn't think. <laughs> yeah, I always make jokes that Wild Mongrel can always dodge Doomblade. Oh yeah, 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 because he's counter on resolution. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, this kind of fell a little short in that tournament. Um, wasn't as correct about my expectations, or at least my bracket didn't fall that way. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how that tournament went for the both of us. If you were to play that tournament again, would you run it back? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, the format was, like, really, really varied. With I honestly only saw two Tron pilots. So, my honestly, like one of my really bad matchups was almost non existent there. Mm -hmm. And all I faced uh, uh, that day was like blue black control, mono blue delver, is it blitz, boggles, um, mono green stompy, and elves. Mm -hmm. uh, elves was my only loss because uh, I am dumb and I did not pay an additional mana on my crypt rats because <laughs> my opponent forgot that. Uh, Sky, uh, the spider silk armor was in play. Great. That's yeah, good. It, it, felt, it felt amazing. Good because focus though, to attention, both of you. Right? Because <laughs> we both put all of our things in the graveyard and like marked the life total down, and before I passed the turn, he was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and he just like, puts all his dads back in play. I was like, well, that sucks. But yeah, yeah I, no, like, oh. <laughs> I understand that. I think if I were to run it back, um, I would have made the decision that I was so close to making before the tournament and playing Flicker. Uh, because oh. I love that deck. Yeah, it seems really fun to do. Um, I'm very. I have a lot of reps with it under my belt. I'm very used to playing that deck. 
Um, and I probably would have played that instead if I had a second go at it. But all right. That's enough about the past, because that tournament is, what, like, four or five months ago now? Yeah, right there. Uh, so let's move on to the current state of Popper, which, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, hasn't changed all that much. Um, one nice thing about Popper is while it is, uh, while it's technically stagnant, as in the decks don't change, it's super diverse. If we look up at the goldfish statistics for like the top decks, um, there are five different decks at above a five percent share of the meta, and the highest meta share is only six point six four percent. But that doesn't take into account the weird algorithms they have, where they have 13 Tron decks and then 13 Wooberg decks, which are just Tron. <laughs> yeah. So, like, um, Tron is actually at 11% of the meta, about. Yeah. They basically... The algorithm separates them from what it looks like between, like, a blue-red variant and then a more flicker based variant on the like tron side that makes sense like your din robo horror versions versus your uh just straight up the red versions yeah the rolling thunder with bolts and mystical teachings and all that stuff well, yeah, no, that... teachings but <laughs> yeah i mean most of those tron decks are definitely gonna be on teachings it's so free for them oh yeah but um so you have your current popper metagame um tron sitting on top in a couple different variants Followed by your red, white, Kadolfa, Kadolfa Boros. Just the general control mid-range Delver Slayer. The creature deck beat upper. <laughs> oh yeah, it's great. And then you have uh, Is It Delver, keeping all the uh, people trying to do cute stuff in check. And then Affinity, keeping all the people uh, with uh, Gorilla Shamans in their sideboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As hey, of... Well, destroy all lands. It's great. <laughs> it's fantastic. As of recent, there hasn't been any weird, weird decks that have uh, cropped up. I see, according to these percentages, that Slivers is actually taking 2% of the meta now. Yep. So that one's on the rise. Um, I think the most interesting one, and MTG Goldfish uh, had an article on it a couple weeks back, was the uh, Jeskai Tokens deck. I don't know if you've seen this list. I don't believe I have. I'm Let me go ahead and pull it up. It's very similar to the uh, red white list from the challenge. Okay. But Is it uh, just, just kind of mid range on the metagame? Uh, no, it's a couple before it. Okay. But um, you're looking at this creature base of Sacred Cat, Anointer Priest, Seeker of the Way. And then you're in blue for Brainstorm and a couple copies of Sot Scour and Deep Analysis. Oh boy. <laughs> And then um, looks like we're just in red for Faithless Looting and Lightning Bolt. I really like this Faithless Looting Deep Analysis pair. That's really fun. I like that. And then Raise the Alarm, Prismatic Strands, Rally the Peasants, Battle Screech. This is a very interesting list. I'm not sure if this is the best version of this list. But looking at a couple different variants, they all seem to be on this like Deep Analysis, Faithless Looting. It kind of feels in a way, and this is a long shot of the truth, but... Like, kind of like how Bardu Pyromancer plays in Modern, where you get to play Faithless Looting as this engine card instead of just this uh, uh, looting card. Mm -hmm. I like that, too. Um, there's also a similar list that I saw Ross Miriam playing on the Versus series, but it was Naya instead of Jeskai. Um, I really like that list a lot because you can also just shove in the uh, Presence of Gone Midnight Guard combo in there. Yeah, that, that's back when they were doing the Versus videos pre-SCG uh, Con Summer. Um, yeah. I've always kind of liked the Gone combo decks. I just feel like playing those two cards means that you will sometimes have uh, free wins, but you're playing two cards that are just strictly worse than the rest of your cards on their own. That's true. Um, I have done some like reps with the deck where I've just put Presence of Gond on like a O one plant token just to gain like a uh, chomp blocker every turn, mm -hmm. um, which just to buy time to sprout swarm them out of the game or just uh, dig for a rally the peasants and just get them in the air. Yeah, that that, that definitely makes sense as a a good way to go about that. 
So one thing I wanted to bring up while I was looking through some of the lists that I have been a little bit out of the research, and one of the main reasons I wanted to start doing this was to get a little uh, back in that research loop. Mm-hmm. One thing that I did not notice was Tron playing Elvish Rejuvenator. Oh yeah, um, me and uh, our mutual friend Lance, uh, he got to tell me I told you so on that. Mm-hmm. Because he was speculating when M19 came out that it was going to find a home in Popper, and I swore up and down that it wouldn't. But of course, it it somehow found its way. I find that interesting. Very good in that list. Because if I was actually thinking about it more when I looked at the card, I definitely would have been like, "This card is actually a sleeper for Tron." Yeah. I can see your argument, though. Yeah. It does cost three. Yeah, also, to be honest, I misread it when we were having this argument. Did you think it I said thought, basic? Uh, no, I thought it said put the rest on in your graveyard. <laughs> oh, that card would be insane if it said graveyard. Yeah. It would find a like a different home. Yeah, it would be mean. like... I, that card would be like good on like a tortured existence list if it said graveyard. Oh yeah, it would be ridiculous in that list. <laughs> no, but um, I really like Elvish Rejuvenator in this list, and just looking at it... Um, your Monomic Wall, Mole Drifter, Denrova Horror, and then just a pretty stock couple one ofs, nothing too special, one teachings, triple Pulse Amorasa with the Elvish Rejuvenator, I'm a big fan of. Oh, yeah. But yeah, um, while some people think that a three drop to pl- that you can't play until turn three in Tron is a little awkward, when we're talking about Popper Tron, we're talking about decks that are only playing like three expedition maps and no other way to search out lands. This deck is not a Tron or Die type of deck like uh, past Tron decks have been or anything like that. Hmm. So they have the ability to go like Thornwood Falls, Island, Tron piece, and then Rejuvenator get another Tron piece or something. That's perfectly fine for them. Yeah, Tron is just extra value, essentially. And like your finisher in the end. Mm -hmm. It's their inevitability piece more than their uh, primary win condition. Exactly. Yeah, no, I like this list. I feel like I want to mess around with my Tron list to make it a little closer to this list. Yeah, this is the list I actually uh, picked up the other day, but I... The only thing I switched out was minus one Disney Rover Horror, and I, like, shoved in a Rolling Thunder to see if I could, like, diversify a little bit more. I think that's possible, but I think you don't have enough red sources. I feel like if yeah. you're on Din Rover Horror, there has to be a copy of uh, uh, Swift Water Cliffs in the list. Yeah, um, I'm, I agree with you after I've gotten, like, a, a couple of reps in, because you... Again, it's, like, extremely your light game when you get that double red source, mm-hmm. and you're just using it to... Uh, attempt to just burn them for 20 just randomly or it's just like such a good removal piece oh just... yeah against elves it's amazing oh yeah but but uh against elves i basically had to stall the board uh as much as possible until i got the double red and most of the time when i got the double red it was like way too late that's that's a fair uh part of that argument yeah so, so we might I might move some Thornwoods Falls to Swiftwaters, like maybe a three and one split, or two and two, mm-hmm. uh, in order to force that. Or I'll just go back to the double Dinrova Horror. I feel like there are some definitely some options to mess around with there, and uh, we need to get some more games in with it. I feel like to uh, confirm that. Oh, definitely. But um, so we've talked about the meta game. So as of five p.m. EST. The Popper Challenge has not been posted from yesterday. So we're going to talk about uh, the Popper Challenge from 10, I believe it's 10-7. Yep, 10-7-2018. As we look at this list, uh, first place, 6-0, Blue-White Flicker. So you and I previously started a conversation on do we think that it is a deck that is poised to make a comeback in the format. What's your opinion on that? I think it will because um, these uh, Flicker decks, uh, they were prevalent in the format until they basically got hated out of it by sideboard cards, and the meta has shifted um, to the point where it's 
not hated out anymore. People are more focused on like hating out graveyard style strategies mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, these flicker ones. Um, what is one of the primary ways that, like, if this deck does get really, really popular, that you would want to hate out this deck? Like, how are the, what are the best ways to hate out uh, Blue White Flicker? Um, honestly, a uh, few more copies of Bajuka Bog, just in case their ghostly flickers or uh, get into the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Or if in, we're talking about, like, uh, Tron getting back, like, capsize. Um, just attempting to make their capsizes and their ghostly flickers fizzle. So if they target their mnemonic wall, you s somehow deal four damage to it, or whatever creature their other creature they're targeting for value, you kill that one, and then the spell fizzles. Okay. Um, and then you can exile it while it's in the graveyard after you fizzled it. Yeah, there are a lot of different ways to interact with uh, the deck, but when we're talking about the blue white uh, flicker deck specifically, we're not talking about the Tron lists. Yeah. The, talking uh, about like the game. Sunscape Familiar side. Um, and my other question to ask for you is, do you think an Esper build that goes all in on eight copies of Familiar and uh, playing cards like Prosperous Pirates to try to combo out more is something that would be better than these lists that are more looking for a value game that if they get multiple Familiars, they get to do the thing where they bounce an island and a Monomic Wall? Yeah. I think the Prosperous Pi Pilots... Um build is like way more unexpected so mm -hmm. people wouldn't exactly know how to play test against it so you definitely have the sur surprise factor there but the value engine is just so almost overwhelming in a lot of matchups where you just cannot beat it mm -hmm. while against the uh prosperous pilots build it does l slow it down a little bit to the point where certain aggro decks might be able to get there well you can have turn five kills with the pirates build really Yes. If you lead on, it, it, it does require you to go familiar, familiar into, like, pi, uh, the snap double land uh, situations. Okay. But they do exist. Gotcha. Yeah. That should be fun, then. I, I'd like to dabble in that. Because that, that's the list that I have. That's the one that I like to mess around with. Because I think that the more combo-centric variant of it has a little bit more just, like, push towards the format. And I'm not really a fan of playing a card like Sage's Road Denizen if we're not playing the Pirates to go infinite. Right. Because to be able to go infinite with this deck, you have to have already had Sage's Road Denizen, have two of your Sunscape Familiars, a Ghostly Flicker, and a Monomic Wall. So the Denizen has to be in play. You Flicker Wall Island, and you get infinite mills on your opponent. You do have the secondary infinite of if there's a God Pharaoh's Faithful in play, you go to infinite life, which I believe is the primary thing this deck is going for. Yeah. Both ways are, like, very cool. Um, does your list run the Dignitary at all as, like, a backup plan? It's a sideboard plan. Sideboard plan, gotcha. Um, because it just so gives annoying. you so much time against decks like Elves and Heroic and all the creature decks. Oh, yeah. Um, while, like, playing any sort of aggro deck uh, and you see Dignitary come down, it's almost so soul-crushing. <laughs> oh, it is. It is awful. One thing I do like about these lists that I do probably want to go ahead and integrate into mine is the copies of Avon Rift Watcher in the sideboard. Uh... 3 mana, 2, 3 flying, vanishing 3. That's a keyword everyone's very familiar with. And then right. when he enters the battlefield or leaves, you gain 2 life. So if you Ghostly Flicker and Aven Rift, uh, Rift Watcher, you gain 4. Okay, that's cool. So it kind of plays that lone missionary plan, um, but it has flying and a higher toughness threshold, so it's good against Delver, in a sense. Yeah, it's uh, harder to get rid of, definitely, and it's not like fire multiple. Mm-hmm. Alright, um, I think that the the Flicker decks are definitely becoming more prominent and therefore have uh, a part of the meta share going forward, but I personally think that they won't be as prominent on Magic Online versus Paper events for the sheer factor of you can't really do infinite combos on Moto very well, especially, yeah, especially not one like the Pirates combo. 
where you have so to like tricks. sacrifice treasures and then ghostly flicker guys. Yep, then that would just take way too much time. So I can understand why this deck might not be um, the best for, or the the Esper build might not be the best for Moto, just because. And that not everyone's like this, but there are a lot of people that refuse to concede. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, but I think if we had more popper or uh, paper tournaments, I just feel like uh, your meta game would look dramatically different. Definitely, because you can do shortcuts on paper that you can definitely cannot do online. <laughs> yeah, if I have like uh, Monomaqual Pirates Flicker, I can just look at my phone and I was like, I have infinite treasures. And then yeah. go flicker my Sage's Rodenas and uh, flicker my Seagate Oracle and say, I'm going to pick up my whole deck. <laughs> exactly. You, you can't really do that one on a... I would hate to do it with Sage's Rodenas and on Moto. It's like one top, one bottom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to click, like... click them every time. <laughs> uh, like this guy who... Uh... Tops, he must have the like the fastest mouse hand in the West. Well, I mean, again, he's not on like the pure combo build. But um you see him 5 0ing and he's six owed multiple challenges. Uh he actually six owed the challenge the week prior as well. With a oh, similar yeah, list. Yeah. Cup, not many, many changes. But um no, it looks like he wasn't on Pyroblast the week before. And splashed blue land or red lands into his deck for the one we're looking at to play Pyroblast in the sideboard. Okay. Which I, I'm a fan. I, I'm a fan of your Delver matchup is definitely one of the hard ones for this deck. Oh yeah, because it can just easily fly over. Like, do you have any flying creatures main board? You have Mold Drifter. Drifter. Yeah. But um, the more the issue for the Delver matchup is, they just counter everything. Exactly. You're like. Look at my zero three defenders. They're so beautiful. So that's enough talking about the uh, the Esper deck from the challenge or the uh, blue white flicker deck. Our five ones we have Affinity and Tron, which we've seen a hundred times. Mm -hmm. We're very familiar with what those decks look like. Yeah, and then we have still makes me salty. Oh, what was that? A tog fling still makes me salty. <laughs> I just hate that that's like a way you can win in Popper. Just like, oops. <laughs> I accidentally won. But um, we have Holika coming in 5 1 with a Grixis teachings list. And this is one of those decks that I always want to be good enough for this format, but exactly. it never has been for me. And what I like about this. Is every time I've built Grixis Teachings, I'm going black based instead of red based. And here he's playing a blue red control deck, splashing Devour Flesh, Terminate, Soul Manipulation, and Flashback on Teachings. Yep, that's pretty cool. Um, I wonder why they don't go up on more copies of Terminate. I feel like it, it, it might just be a mana consideration, but they're looking for their direct removal to be Flame Slash and Lightning Bolt, it looks like. Right. This is an Archaeomancer list as well, so this is like the blue-red control, like, I'm going to slow burn you out of this game. That's his win condition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Comparative Analysis is a sweet card. Oh, yeah, it's. I really like that card. <laughs> It's not uh, actually something I've seen in a list before. Exactly. Um, it's mo probably because they just have so much interaction on their turn mm -hmm. that you can just cast it for the surge cost. You know what sideboard card I'm a huge fan of? Cryptic Curse? Luxa River Shrine. Hello, what? Hold on, what? <laughs> Three mana artifact. You can pay one and tap it to gain a life and put a brick counter on it. And then you may tap it to gain two life only if there are three or more brick counters on it. So this is like your burn sideboard. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you pay six mana over th four turns and you get three life. And then after that, you just get two life every turn. I guess it can I'm just not incrementally get there. 
I'm not sure this card is better than a pristine talisman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to say the least. I also really like the crypt incursion. I, I, I like respecting your tortured existence matchup. Yeah, and also you can bring it in uh, against burn just to just randomly shoot up at life. But um, it, it like, are you targeting yourself? They don't have any creatures. Yeah, um, you if they choose to bolt your augers or okay or Kaomancers, it could get there, and you can also evoke your mold drifter. Okay, that makes just to sense. Get, like three, six, maybe nine life. That's enough to change the course of the game. All right. And then moving on from the Grixis deck, which is uh, very sweet, and I'm very happy to see it doing a 5-1. We have a red-white tokens list um, on Sacred Cat, Secret of the Way, Squadron Hawk, um, some removal, Faceless Looting, Raise the Alarm, uh, Rally the Peasants, Battle Screech. So we see another of these Faceless Looting, Battle Screech, Rally the Peasants decks. Mm -hmm. And I find it really interesting to see this like flashback-centric... Um, also, just Sacred Cat as a card that uh, has synergy with Faithless Looting. <laughs> right. I like seeing these kinds of decks do well. Oh, yeah. It just makes it, it just shows you once again how diverse the popper format is. Mm -hmm. And I think it will, like, forever be in this, like, paradox of being solved and also unsolved. Oh, absolutely. You have these tournaments where you will expect the three copies of Is It Delver and all of these things hanging out in 4 and 2. But, like, your 5-1, everything above 4 and 2, aside from Tron and Affinity, is kind of an unexpected deck. Mm -hmm. Like, um, while this red-white tokens deck is sweet, there isn't that much to go about it. But right below it, it's a blue-white build of Tron, which is on, like, Lone Missionary, Rift Watcher, Custody Squire, Compulsive Research, multiple copies of Deep Analysis, a full set of map in Azorius Signet, and then he's on, like, Seal of Removal, Angelic Renewal, Weird. and Ristic Circle. The Ristic Circle is an interesting one because you can simply just out mana them yeah but... three copies <laughs> yeah seems a little much this guy is that high on how good a Ristic circle is for him also this guy thinks his delver matchup is atrocious because he's playing two cop blue in the sideboard this, uh... <laughs> this is a this is a pile <laughs> Hello there. I guess he, he doesn't care about like Stompy or Burn because he runs Lone Missionary and the Avon Rift Watcher. And already. Ristic Circle. And Ristic Circle. And, <laughs> and Coalition Honor Guard. Yeah, he's he's got a lot of value to go against this type of decks. This deck is okay. really interesting. Yeah, it's just like, I'm going <laughs> to do my thing. I'm going to do it really well. I love her two Azorius Chancelleries and her Tron deck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta gain more life with your Tranquil Coast. You gotta gain incremental value, but somehow set yourself off of getting Tron further. This deck yeah, is a pile. I, yeah, I, <laughs> maybe they bounce their like, one of Secluded Step. They're like, I think playing, like the best one to bounce. They're playing Avon Rift Watcher, but there are zero copies of Ghostly Flicker in this deck. I, j I don't know, man. <laughs> Like, how are these better than the Lone Missionaries for what you're trying to do? They're not. Because <laughs> they already do their thing if... I don't know. You're really trying to figure it out, man. Yeah, I'd... I'm frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> You've been anchored. You're right. I'm just like, why, why you do this? There's one other deck I wanted to look at. And this one's a little bit further down on this list. And this is the blue-red deck that Entropy263 uh, used. And the primary reason I wanted to look at this is because it's a 4-Augur, no-other-win-conditions uh, blue-red deck. But it's because we're playing two different um, Guilds of Ravnica cards. We're playing three copies of Devious Cover-Up. And for those not familiar... <laughs> Devious cover-up is two blue-blue instant. Counter-target spell. If that spell is countered this way, 
exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard, you may shuffle up to four cards from your graveyard into your library. What are your thoughts on this card? Um, <coughs> I've definitely played the card in my draft and sealed decks, mm -hmm. but I didn't expect it to make its way to Popper. Would you be surprised if I would tell you that this is not the first time I have seen it in a deck list? I would ask you, what was the other one? Multiple different teachings lists. Okay, I can see it in that shell, actually. They're cutting exclude for it. Okay. So they're taking away uh, in immediate card advantage for an exile clause on the counter spell, along with uh, longevity to a game. Yeah, that I that definitely matters against it with uh, teachings, because you have so many one-ofs mm -hmm. that you can shuffle back four of your one-ofs, or even your teachings again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of like that the thought process of devious cover-upping a spell, and then like a bit putting one of your teachings back in the deck. Yep. And then the other card from Guilds of Ravnica that this deck is playing two copies of... I love this card. It's Hypothesis, which, again, for those not familiar, three a blue and a red instant Draw two cards, then you may discard a non-land card. When you deal, it does four damage to target creature. So, it's five mana, draw two, instant. And then you may make it a looting effect to kill something. Yeah, I really like this card. I thought it was going to make its way to, like, Grixis uh, and blue-red, like, kind of control decks. Okay. When I first saw it um i love this card in like b both limited formats and popper because it does have that option to become a kill spell i think it would be so much more played and also maybe even kind of busted in the popper format if it didn't have the non-land clause oh absolutely if they could just discard a land this card would be insane in my opinion exactly so um, you have to have like something with flashback or some way to also just gain additional value from your cards that you're discarding the hypothesis will. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still a fantastic card. Just having an instant speeds flame slash that also gives you card advantage is so good. And five mana, like a lot of players will look at five mana, and if you're not super familiar with the pop format, five mana is not that hard. Oh yeah, not at all. There's one other uh, card, and this isn't a Guilds of Ravnica card that I want to bring up about this list, and that is the one copy of Jace's Erasure. Yeah. Um, I really like this idea that in the control mirror, you can resolve a Jace's Erasure at some point in the game, and then just have two devious cover-ups, and just never deck, because they keep shuffling each other. It's so great. <laughs> just like, I'm eventually going to mill you. It's going to be like 10 years from now, but I'm going to get there. You never get to play spells. I'm just going to keep putting, like, Brainstorm, Counterspell, Devious Cover-Up as my three cards back in my deck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't get to play. <laughs> and I'm going to deck you. One thing I don't like is playing Think Twice over Accumulated Knowledge and Adjacent Erasure deck. Yeah, I tend to agree with you there. Uh, maybe their thought process was with the flashback on Apothecizel. But I do Oh okay. Like no, I like that a lot better with that as a discussion. Yeah. Okay. Because it makes it an easier kind of uh toss to hypothesis if you're removing something and also just drawing a card later in the game when you need to. Yeah, so you have one Una's Grace, um one or two firebolts and four think twice that are just good discards. Okay, no, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. <coughs> so then th it looks like he also 5 owed in the league that we're going to look at. Oh, that's awesome. I'm not sure the list is all that... Um, it looks like he went to two Jace's Erasures and took out the Serrated Arrows. He moved oh, that yeah. to the sideboard. I'm guessing his uh, Delver matchup, or slash Elves matchup, was slightly better than he thought. Yeah, he went up to three Lightning Bolts. Okay, yeah, I see. Instead of the one... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah okay that's not all that different alright so that's about everything I wanted to talk about about that popper challenge was there anything that you saw that you wanted to bring up specifically um, hold on let me go back to the deck list um, 
Oh, the shift in the meta from going straight up blue black control to going blue black delver. It seems like more people have been shifting towards the delver uh, tempo pressure variant instead of the straight up blue black control. Okay. Yeah, that is definitely an interesting uh, part. Yeah, you see a couple of these like uh, blue black delver lists. Although at the very bottom, uh, Heinz01 has a full on no creatures the teachings list going on with two conjurers bottle hanging out in the mix. Wait, where is this deck list? At the very bottom of the challenge. Um, H-E-I-S-E-N-01. Oh, I see it. <laughs> we're, we're on, again? Heisen. Yeah. Heisen one yeah. exclude, three devious cover-up, uh, multiple teachings, and then we're on two conjurers bobble. Hmm. Very He's interesting. Going all in on Evan Cartus. Yeah, that's his single win condition is the the, the talisman Evan Cards Justice list. Yeah. I th also like this list brings up a, another point. I think a reason why they're going from blue black control to Delver is because using the cap size and the Evan Cards Justice as your win cons has become just too slow in the format. Okay, yeah, I would agree with that. A lot of these control decks like that's a heavy mana investment for a non-tron deck. And oh, it's yeah. it's definitely uh, shown when we look at these matchups, like, a lot of the decks have just kind of got a little bit faster than that. And as we kind of shift over to the league, we'll see this with um, our 5 lists, including multiple different goblins lists, including a weird black-red goblins list that's, like, going all in to go to Street Wraith in a 4 of. Well, oh, let's, yeah. let's pull up that goblins list we were talking about a little bit earlier. <laughs> I gotcha. The one by uh, DJ Glitter? Yes. Because we're looking at our normal, like, mono-red aggro uh, creature suite of, like, Foundry Street Denizen, Bushwhacker, Burning Tree Emissary, Mog War Marshal, Keldon Marauders, and all that stuff. We have a couple copies of Machino Pyromancer, a couple co uh, playset of Gitu Lava Runner, and then as far as all in as we can go, we're on four Street Race 4 Gitaxian Probe. I, too, like playing with 52 cards. He's also on four Mana Morphos. I really like he's, this he's idea... A, he's a he's I really a like this idea of being able to go, like, Foundry Street Denizen into, like, Burning Tree, Mana Morphos, drew another Burning Tree, play another Mana Morphos, and then kick a Goblin Bushwhacker or something. Yeah, it just gives you a way to dig more and more in your, into your deck to become even faster. So let's talk about the card that I, I brought up earlier. The best card. G giant baiting. <laughs> Two and green red hybrid sorcery. Create a four four red and green giant warrior creature token with haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. Conspire. As you cast a spell, you may tap two untapped creatures you control that share a color with it, and when you do, copy it. I have never seen this card before today. Neither have I, but <laughs> I believe that. You can just win out of nowhere with this if... Oh, yeah. Um, Mog War they... Marshal in this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you just give that extra oomph to get there below before they, like, stabilize the board. Mm -hmm. Or even if they do stabilize the board and they make the mistake of swinging out and probably not having Counterspell back up, depending upon the deck, you can just Giant Bait once and get that last little hit in mm -hmm. to get there. Like, Giant Bait, Fire Blast, just deal eight and you get there. It's great. This is this is just a beautiful card. I'm very interested to see if this card is playable. I probably want to grab a couple copies and mess around with it in like a goblin shell, like oh, uh, maybe yeah. even a shell similar to this. But um, I definitely want to test some stuff out with it. Yeah, I might also try it in that uh, Jund Hackblade Nia Hushblade sort of list. Oh, like uh, the like five colored cards. Um, no, it's mostly Nia. It's ba it basically works like Little Zoo. Oh, right, oh, right, oh, right, oh. Yeah, it uses the um, the one green-red attacking creatures get plus one, plus oh, and Cascade. Um, oh, or, Virulent uh, Outburst. There you go, thank you. Um, you can't Cascade in the Giant Baiting, but you can definitely use both of them to just gain so much explosive low-to-the-ground advantage mm -hmm. to get there. I mean, if you're casting this with like three mana, two, four, four, just haste. Like, that's a lot of damage to a player that doesn't have, like, blockers. 
Oh, yeah. Like, if you have creatures in play, and, like, your blue-black teachings deck has to use a counterspell on this, but you still got a 4-4 for the turn, like, that's just a huge beating. Oh, yeah, man. And um, looking at it, this isn't his first 5-0. It looks like he has two others with a very similar deck. All, oh, yeah. Both of them, or one of them, on giant baiting still. One of them playing less lands. <laughs> he's on 16 in this list, but in the list that I'm looking at from before, he's on 15. A copy of Reckless Abandon and a Reckless Charge take the place of the giant baitings. Hmm. I have to read some of these. <laughs> You're fine. Reckless Abandon is the one mana sorcery that um, is like a fling, but it always deals four. Oh, so it's the thing they play because they can't play Goblin Grenade. Or they can't play Grenade, or they can't play, like, uh, Galvanic Blast. Right. And then it's on a Reckless Charge, which is plus three, plus zero in haste, with flashback of two and a red. Okay. That seems all right. Um, I don't like the Reckless Charge, but the Reckless Abandon, if you made that a two of, also very good if, like, the board gets locked. But um, after talking about it, I like the Giant Baiting much more, and it seems like he does too, as that's what he's moved to. Exactly, because you could like just because that card has conspire, it just it's so cool. It's conspire like, is a weird mechanic that we don't get to see a lot. The most you see it in Popper is with Gleeful Sabotage and yep. Elf Sideboards. I mean, just the most I see it in general is when someone decided they wanted to play Wart as a commander. <laughs> but that's also true. <laughs> but all right, other than this black red deck, was there really anything that stood out from this league, the ten uh, ten league? I gotta press back a bunch of times. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> we were looking at a bunch of his lists. Um, See, another of the like blue, black, red control lists that are the Archaeomancer, but this he's not playing any of the new cards in this build. Yeah, there's but, a uh, there's a mono red uh, deck that five owed a mono white heroic and a white black pestilence. White Black Pestilence is a cool deck that I've been having my eye on. I need to, like, try it at some it, point. It just feels like in the matchups that you're bad, you're a zero. <laughs> and I don't like those decks. Oh, I gotcha. The Mono yeah. Red deck is Mono Red Kiln Fiend. Hello? <laughs> We're on four Gitu Lava Runner, three Immolating Soul Leader, and four Kiln Fiend, and then four Looting, Git Probe, Gut shot, lightning bolt, muted genet growth, right of flame, and then apostles blessing, tumor battle rage, fire blast, furor of the bitten. Furor of the bitten. Whoa. <laughs> okay. One mana plus two plus two attacks each turn. That's okay. Um, I like how much Shrexian mana he has. Yes, I'm a fan um, as well. He's going all in. He is. You die in like on turn three, or the game's over the other way. There's no exactly. other discussion. Exactly. Like, I honestly want to know how weird his burn matchup is. Like, if we're on four gut shot, we aren't doing anything but targeting face. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, you go turn two kiln fiend, and just like hope it survives the turn three. And it, if it does, you just hopefully win. <laughs> you just cast so many Frexy mana spells. And also, right of flame? Yeah, Hello? you gotta you gotta go all in. It helps your immolating soul leader so that you can pay more <laughs> towards immolating exactly. soul leader. And also, leader. you can turn one your kiln fiend, man. Yeah! <laughs> well, is there anything that gives um, kiln fiend haste? Um, no, and that's the one thing I don't care for. Is that we're not on any copies of, like, um, Expedite. Or um, something like the new one. The new one was Jumpstart. But Reckless yeah, Abandoned that... would probably be better than the new one was Jumpstart. Or the, sorry, Reckless Charge. The one that gives plus three plus so in haste. Yeah, um, I actually like that a lot in this one. Mm -hmm. I might take out the Fear or the Fire Blast. I'm not a big fan of the Fear of the Bitten. For some reason I thought it granted haste. Um, but if it's just plus two, plus two has to jam, it's not really that exciting of a card. Yeah, I would definitely do either Expedite or the Reckless Charge in its place, so that you can theoretically just turn one, get them. Mm -hmm. 
So, because you could just have enough Rite of Flames to give you enough mana and uh, triggers off of Kiln Fiend um, to give it haste and then do all your Phyrexian mana stuff to just win on turn one. All right. Okay. So, to kind of wrap up this part, I want to ask uh, the question of what would you play if you were to enter in a challenge? If you were to play on the challenge that usually happens on Sundays, I want to say. Like, what would you play? Ooh. Um... If you had an option of any deck. Honestly, I would try try to play my uh, Wooberg Tron list. The, the uh, one you just one picked the, up? Okay. Yeah, the Elvish Rejuvenator list. Uh, it seems very fun, and I would like to get more reps with it, just to, you know, get in there. Tron guy um, over here thinking his deck is fun. Like, hey, hey. <laughs> I get to play magic. Doesn't mean you have to. Um, yeah, just to do that one, and it can just outvalue most decks i feel and if i can't outvalue you i not trying to sound arrogant but i'm oh, gonna try fine. and outplay you no <laughs> I, I understand that um that deck um when a lot of people think about tron and other formats just thinking of like turn three car and herder and i've already brought this up but um no when we're talking about uh popper tron this is a, uh, a thought process deck like you have to like sequence your lands your spells everything has to be perfectly done to win a lot of your games oh yeah if and I, I'm uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you got to make sure, like, when you cast your flickers and your cap sizes, that you know they cannot do interaction for it. And if they do, you can counter that interaction because mm -hmm. having those spells fizzle feels terrible. Oh, it is absolutely horrible. So if I were to play in a challenge, I think I'd go with something close to what Entropy two uh, three uh, six three was the blue red control deck was going for. I really like this idea of this slow control deck with devious cover-up, hypothesis and Jesus Erasure. Oh yeah, I love the hypothesis in there. Um, I'm definitely going to probably pick up that deck at some point. Yeah, no, this I, is, this is the deck it. that I'm going to look through my stuff, see how easy it is for me to put it together without taking other stuff apart. Exactly. Um, even today, um, me, Lance, and Wayne went and grabbed some packs to just do a quick draft, mm -hmm. and I basically did blue red spells. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, with, um, uh, three copies of Apothesis, which is great. <laughs> that card, um, I wasn't like super high on it when I first read it, but then I had to like reread it to remember like this is limited and popper we're talking about. Exactly. But yeah, no, those two decks seem sweet, and I would love to see uh, like Entropy or someone else with a similar list do well with that deck uh, going forward. Uh -huh. So I wanted yeah, to go I... ahead and move on from decks and instead talk about cards. So I'm going okay. to send you a small chunk of cards. And I want to just go over each of them okay, and kind of see, do we think these cards are good enough for proper play? And I think some of these we might have already talked about. These are all Guilds of Ravnica cards. And I'll be saying them as each of them come up. And I just kind of want to go over it. So I'll send each of them, and then we'll scroll to the top of it. So the first one is Artful Takedown. And now this is a weird card to bring up, because it's a very similar card to uh, Agony Warp. Yeah. It is a two blue and a black instant. Choose one or both. Tap target creature, or target creature gets minus two, minus four. Do you think this is a playable card in Popper? Um, I think it is if you're already playing um, a lot of copies of Agony Warp, or you're looking to gain more tempo instead of killing things. It is a lot um, more mana. Twice the amount. Yeah, twice the amount of mana of Agony Warp. Because uh, essentially, if, if you're playing a deck that would do four copies of Agony Warp, you might want copy number five, and this could be copy number five if you really needed it to, but that's really stretching it. So What I like about this card is it can play as a tempo card against cards like Gurmag Angler, so you can like kill a guy and then like tap a Gurmag Angler. Right. And also, you might be able to um, interact with... Is it... Blitz more if they can have enough, you know, mutagenic growth it or the inside out combo you might be able to interact with. Also, just being able to uh, minus four is actually very important here 
because uh, being able to kill something like a Palace Sentinels or a uh, the Nivix Cyclops um, oh, yeah. does matter. Definitely. But yeah, no, I, I understand that approach. It is definitely a fifth copy of Agony Warp, or potentially a one of in a teachings list, but you can't just play this many fours and fives in that deck. Yeah. You can't, because you just won't be able to cast those cards. Okay. On the same term you search them. So moving from that, we've already talked plenty about Devious Cover-Up, so let's go ahead and skip over that one. Direct Current. One red red sorcery. Deals two damage to target to any target, jumpstart. Is this card um, playable in a format that already has Firebolt? I don't believe so, solely because it's three mana. Uh, three mana is already the flashback on Firebolt. Mm -hmm. uh, oh no, Firebolt is five. Oh, it's five for flashback. It is, oh, okay. it is shock at sorcery speed and then flashes at five. Okay. Um... Yeah, I think I would still do Firebolts because playing three mana both times seems worse. Because when you Firebolt the first time, it's normally turn one or two of the game. If you're doing it the second time, you've drawn out the game enough to... To be able to, to use it. That. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just kind of wanted to bring it up. I think it's uh, there's at least an interesting discussion. Because you're paying the same amount of mana. Right. Over both spells. But the first one being three is definitely a big target. And also not having to discard for flashback. Yeah, definitely, because um, I think that the three mana cost on it makes it too slow to counter early stuff until it's too late, and just and because um, going into the later game, it's technically better than Firebolt, but Firebolt has already done its job by the time you cast your first direct current. Mm -hmm. No, I can understand that. All right, yeah. we've already talked plenty about Hypothesis as well. My boy. So we'll move into Crowl Foragers. And this is 4 and a green, 4-4. Four, four. When Crowl Foragers enters the battlefield, you gain one life for each creature in your graveyard. <coughs> Could definitely be a sideboard card uh, for the Tortured Existence decks. Mm -hmm. um, um, my, my one issue with that discussion, and I just did just want to bring it in because I think it's worth the discussion, um, um, is that I think that deck doesn't need more life gain. <laughs> Probably not, considering it already has um, the three drop guy. Um, yeah, brown scale loops is pretty much how good. you win your aggro matchups. Exactly. Um, maybe uh, I don't. Uh, besides the torture resistance decks, I can't really think of anything else. There aren't like many green decks that aren't like Tron. Um, yeah. I know there was a deck I messed around with a while ago that was like. Nibble Mongoose, Wear Bear, um, the 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 two mana fungus that has uh, delirium on it. Hmm. It's uh one in a green for a zero four. It gets plus three plus zero if you have delirium. Um, Interesting. And it kind of got to play this weird like red green mid rangey game where you have like these really powerful early cards, and then you're on like a vessel of nascency, communus the gods, and then. Um, Seal of Fires and Lightning Bolts and stuff. And I think that card, like, might be something I could play in a deck like that. Yeah, I see it having a home there. Just hmm. thinking about it, other than, like, elves, there aren't a lot of forests in Pauper. Yeah, and even with those forests, they normally don't go that long into the game, because Mono Green Stompy... Very aggressive. Elves, very aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, just that Nimble Bongoose deck you mentioned. Um, I remember seeing it before. You can you can try and do something with that. Yeah, just kind of seeing. Um, it might even be main deckable because, like, at the time I was playing like ho Hooting Mandrels, but like that card's so bad with all the threshold cards. Right. Yeah. This is just a better Hootie. Yeah. That, that's that's an interesting uh, thing. I might actually. Uh, I still have all the stuff for it. I might just. See if I can throw something like that together again. Okay, um, cool. Moving down from it, uh, Mephitic Vapors. Two and a black sorcery. All creatures get minus one, minus one until end of turn, surveil two. So is one mana worth surveil two? Because these black decks already play Shred. Exactly. Um, I don't think so, because it be Shrivel being on two mana is so important. 
against the elves matchup or any matchup where you would bring absolute shrivel. Um, okay. That even waiting that one turn, depending on if you're on the player of the draw, gives them time to cast spire silk armor, and then your shrivel is meaningless. Um. So counterpoint to that. Um. So if you're on the play game two and you have a shrivel on two mana, then you're not really gonna get anything but one creature. So I think. This actually might have a spot in your black X control lists in the shrivel spot because while spider sick armor is a good card, I don't know how much you can realistically cite it in against, like, say, an Evan Carr's Justice uh, black deck. Right. Um, I think this is a good bridge gaffer um, to get to your uh, better removal and better board clears. And if you're a Gurmag Angler deck, Surveil is huge. Oh yeah, definitely. Like just getting two lands out of the way to to then delve away is great. I just think there's definitely an argument for both of them, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing copies of this in uh, like uh, popper sideboards moving forward. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, I th there's definitely a case to be made depending upon what de deck you're playing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next one is Notion Rain, one blue black sorcery, surveil two, draw two, lose two. Um, if you're playing a copy of Read the Bones, this will simply replace it, I feel. If you're in both the colors. Yes. I think the, the discussion for it is we don't see any copies of Read the Bones. Exactly. <laughs> um, you might see a couple pop up here or there when people are like playing around with it, mm -hmm. and it might find a home. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I see one or two copies of it in like a blue-black teachings list or some sort of blue-black delve control tempo type a, deal a question i have for you or real quick and this is just on a thought is how good is your is mono black's burn matchup um uh, it's pretty okay honestly um you do damage yourself with your phyrexian ragers your sign and bloods and uh you read the bones but you do have tendrils of corruption mm -hmm. which you can target your own creature at instant speed to gain like six to seven life um which I have done the closeout games before. Uh, besides that, you just try to get up to Gary as fast as possible to mm -hmm. swing games in your favor. My, my, my question for it is, is there a way to build Mono Black to Splash Blue to play like uh, Hydro Blast and Sideboard and maybe even like Negates to Spells and you get to play Notion Rain over the other card because this card also works well with cards like Unearth, but losing out on Tendrils. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I would still lean more towards the tendrils just for have a more streamlined list, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a thought that I can definitely dabble with just making more of a blue, black, more tempo control instead of hard control. Like the lists we have now are mm -hmm. where you're still playing your chittering rats. You're still playing your Kumbaj and Gary's. Yeah, you're a tap-out control deck, more so. Where you're controlling exactly. from the hand and the board perspective instead of the stack. Exactly. Alright, and then the last card I want to bring up is Portcullis Vine, which is one green for a 0-3 defender that you can pay 2 and tap it and sacrifice a creature as defender to draw a card. And the reason I bring this card up is because of the three-color defender combo deck. Yeah, I um, I need to pick up that deck at some point. It seems really fun, um, and this definitely adds a little bit to it. Uh, th did the deck have a one-drop defender beforehand? I don't remember the lists, to be honest. It's been a while. Um, do I. <laughs> defender mill. Time to look it up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, my buddy Jeff was uh, playing it at the Classic, and mm -hmm. I believe... He went, I think he broke even or lost one more match than he won. I think they're on Wall of Vines. What does that one do? Just the one green zero three 3 Reach Defender. Okay. So you're sacrificing Reach for some play against the control deck. Yeah. Um, so the decks where it's relevant to have Reach, it already has three power. So I would definitely prefer Portcullis Vine, I think, because you do gain a card advantage. Mm -hmm. You have this weird uh, little engine that'll show up every once in a while. 
Exactly, and then that could give you to get you to your combo. Mm -hmm. All right, so that definitely makes sense. Those are all the Guilds of Ravnica cards I wanted to kind of talk about. Um, mm -hmm. And in all honesty, looking at the time, it looks like we're about out of time for uh, for for what we're doing this week. Oh yeah. So that's kind of our take on the popper format as it stands. Uh, next week we'll be talking about the 5-0 decklists and the challenge that happened um, next weekend so that we'll have a little bit more material to talk about. Um, going forward, I'd like to look at a lot of different brews, uh, just kind of do some research on some weird stuff that we see, bring some yeah. stuff up, see some fun stuff. Yeah, kind of like a deck profile type deal. Yeah, even if like it's just one of us put something together that we think is adorable. Like I might just put together the red-green deck. And see, like, if there's any interest in trying to work on it more from there. Yeah, I might uh, theory craft of that uh, blue-black uh, control build that we were talking about. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see where you kind of stand with that. Yeah, because uh, you could still run, like, your Baron Moors and, like, switch out maybe two of them for, like, remote aisles. Uh, I don't know if that's blue. necessary. But, like, three and one. I would definitely go three and one. If you're doing like the full blue black, and would like you be on uh, Baron Moor over Lonely Sandbar? Uh, hmm. One nice thing is you get to play Demir Aqueduct, so you can pick up your Baron Moors, and you can do like the Kudolta Boros thing where you play one tap on one and then pick it up. Exactly. Um, I'll definitely think about Lonely Sandbar, but being like the one mana, I think is prevalent in. The sort of tempo control, like, yeah, builds. sandbar is the one mana one. Oh, sandbar is one. I Roma, it was... Remote Island is the one that gets played because it's played in Trons because you can yeah, cycle it for one. colorless. Right, you're you're right. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting them confused. No, you're there. fine. Alrighty, but um, from your host and the chittering rat himself, this has been the Princes of Popper podcast. Thank you for tuning in with us, and we hope to see you again next week.